Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's course enrollment webinar. My name is Safar Amanazi. I'm an academic and financial aid advisor in the Office of the Registrar at UTM. And joined with me today is my colleague, Dre, and two of our wonderful peer leaders. So I'd like to invite them to introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. My name is Dre, and I'm an academic advisor in the Office of the Registrar. Welcome to UTM. Um, I'm going to be here in the background managing the chat. Hello everyone, my name is Ming. I'm a fourth year student and uh, I'm one of the peer leaders in the Office of Register. I'm here to share my experience as an upper year student. Hello everyone, my name is Ni. I'm also a fourth year student here at UTM and one of your peer leaders. And I'm here today to share uh, some of my first year experience as, as well as some of the resources that I think you might find useful. Thank you all. I'd also like to thank our behind the scene production team who worked who works to make this um, webinar possible. Um, so as you can see on the screen, um, you can uh, this webinar is geared towards students who've been admitted to the sciences streams. Uh, but if you um, you're been admitted to a different stream um, and you've decided to attend this one, or you maybe you're considering to switch your program, um, they can still stick around because a lot of the information that we will um, cover today is also similar to uh, and applicable to other programs. Um, I'd also um, like to um, just uh, make a few notes of uh, a few housekeeping items. Um, so I'll be going over a presentation uh, in the beginning um, and uh, if you have any questions, um, you may want to maybe wait to see if your questions will be covered during the presentation, or feel free to drop them in the chat. Please engage in the chat, and my colleague Dre or our two peer leaders will be either answering your questions in the chat, or maybe ask you to save those questions until our Q&A period towards the end um, to be addressed to the full group. All right, so as always, we'd like to start with the acknowledgement of traditional land. Uh, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. All right, so this is our agenda for today, and this is what we hope um, to um, go over. Um, so you can, as you can see, there is a lot of information that we'll cover, and we'll start with highlighting a few important dates that you need to keep in mind uh, about course enrollment. We'll also then, um, you know, talk about the UTM, your UTM degree structure and requirements. Uh, we'll also um, go over, you know, what your pro what program means and you know how to choose your program, and as well as course selection. Uh, we'll also um, cover, uh, you know, some planning resources to help you with um, that. And then we'll discuss a few next steps um, that you need to take during the summer, uh, including making a payment and obtaining your student card or what we refer to as T-card. Right. So a few important dates that you need to, you know, keep in mind and um, bookmark in your calendars. Uh, so, of course, it's the course enrollment day. Um, so that's the big day where you would go ahead on ACORN and enroll in your courses. And for year one students, it is July 19th. Um, so your that may vary for students who have been maybe admitted on transfer credits. Um, and depending on the number of credits that you've received as transfer credits, you may be if you are if you've obtained 4.0 credits or more, you may be enrolling in uh, with, with year two or year three students. But if you've been just recently admitted to UTM and you have um, no transfer credits or been awarded transfer credits, but less than um, 3.5 credits, then you'll be enrolling with um, year one students on July 19th. And there are a few things that you can do um, prior to the July 19th date um, to, to help you get you know ready and be prepared to uh, enroll in courses at your start time. Um, and we'll talk about this during our presentation today. Um, there is also the deadline to pay or defer your fees. Um, so that's the deadline to actually become registered. And the date is August 16th. So course enrollment is when you enroll in your courses on ACORN, but you're not yet registered. To register, you need to either um, pay your fees um, or defer your fees if you are eligible on the basis of scholarship or uh, government student aid. Um, and then the first day of classes uh, is September 6th. Um, that's when classes start for F and Y courses. F means the fall term courses and Y means y in full year courses. Um, and you have until September 19th um, to make 
you know, to add or drop FNY courses. So you'll have some time to test out your classes and you may, you know, think that you're not interested in a class after attending a few lectures and want to maybe change it, drop and add different courses. You have until September 19th to do so for FNY courses. Okay, so let's talk about your UTM degree. Um, so to earn your degree at UTM, there are two sets of requirements that you need to complete. Uh, and those are the general requirements. Um, general requirements are for all students, so they're similar to all students. And that includes something like completion of 20 credits, uh, uh, you know, or distribution requirements. Um, so these are general requirements that all students at UTM need to complete as part of their degree requirements. Um, there are also the program of study requirements. So that varies depending on your choice of program. Um, so there are specific program requirements that you need to complete um, uh, in addition to your general requirements to earn your UTM degree. Um, and there are four types of degrees at UTM. There is the Honors Bachelor of Science, there is the Honors Bachelor of Arts, um, the Bachelor of Commerce, and the Bachelor of Business Administration. And the, the, the type of degree that you would graduate with will depend on the combination of programs that you will um, decide or that you, you decide to uh, pursue. So we'll talk about that again in, in our presentation um, later. Okay, so the general requirements. What are these general requirements? Um, all students at UTM must complete a general set of requirements as part of their U of T degree. And this includes uh, completing at least 20 credits um, and earning a cumulative grade point average or what we refer to as CGPA. Um, and that needs to be at least 1.85 or more by the graduation time. And of course, there are basic, other basic requirements, um, one of which is the program of study uh, or what we refer to as subject posts. And you'll hear this term more often, um, you know, as you start your UTM studies and during your degree. So the subject posts is what we refer to, uh, and that stands for program of study. Um, and there is a minimum combination of programs that you need to complete as part of your um, degree requirements. And that is either one specialist or two majors or one major and two minors. Um, and uh, there is also the distribution requirement portion of your basic degree requirements. And what that means is that you need to complete at least three credits um, and one, one credit needs to be in each of the disciplines. So one credit needs to be in humanities, one credit needs to be done in social sciences, and you need to complete one credit in sciences. Um, so on, depending on the basis of your, you know, program requirements, you might maybe, uh, if let's say a student is uh, in a biology or doing a biology major, uh, the student will already be taking you know, Bio 152, for example, and Bio 153. These are two science courses, and that by default will already be counted towards the sciences um, distribution requirement. So in that case, the student would just have to explore human humanities uh, and social sciences um, credit uh, to fulfill the distribution requirement. Um, there's also the, you know, the completion of 20 credits um, to graduate, and you cannot complete um, 20 credits by just doing first year courses. So there's a minimum number of upper year courses that you need to complete as part of your degree requirement. And um, of the 20 credits, you need at least 13 credits at the 200 level or higher. And of these 13 credits, you need at least six credits that must be at the 300 or 400 level. Okay, so program of study. We have over 180 programs at UTM. Um, so because of, you know, you have 180 programs to choose from, you can create your own unique experience at UTM by choosing the different combination of programs that fit you and your interests and goals. Um, and we have three concentration types. So we have a specialist, a major, and a minor. So the real difference between these three concentration types is how many credits you would take within a specific discipline. So for a specialist program, you're looking to take credits between 10 to 18 um, credits towards within a specific subject area. Um, and so you'll be more concentrated and you'll be taking more upper year courses within that discipline or within that subject area. Um, so if a student enjoys a certain subject area and really wants to do more courses within that subject area, then that student might decide to do a specialist program. Um, you might have less room for electives in that case because you're doing most of your courses um, within that subject area. Um, 
for if you decide to do a major, um, you'll be taking courses. You'll you'll be um, doing courses or credits between eight point five and nine credits um, in a, within a specific subject area, and um, that allows you to combine programs. Um, so you may decide then to do another major in a different subject area if you enjoy two areas of study. For example, you might decide to do a, a double major in earth sciences and biology, for example, um, or biology and chemistry. So that allows you to combine, uh, or it could, it could be maybe biology in some other program uh, outside of the sciences stream as well. That is also possible. You can choose um, any other program, maybe sociology, if you're interested in that. Um, or uh, you may decide to do a double minor uh, along with the major. And uh, for a minor, you'll be doing between four to 4.5 credits. Um, so you'll be taking less uh, for, you know, upper year courses uh, within that minor program. Um, so you, you'll be doing less courses. So sometimes students may, you know, want to learn a new language or you want to, they a student might decide um, that they want to maybe combine French minor along with a biology major and um, a minor in philosophy, for example. So you can, again, combine the programs the way you, you know, that works with you and your interests and goals. Uh, again, to recap, you can customize your degree the way that works uh, with you. Um, you can specialize and focus on one program or combine it you know, combine up to three programs to diversify your interests and goals. Um, you may be, you know, it's some, again, it's sometimes you might come in with, um, you know, one program in mind, but as you take courses and, uh, you know, learn more about yourself, um, at, you know, in your first year, you might decide that you want to pick up, you know, a, a different, you know, ma minor or a major um, or combine programs um, that would, you know, be of most interest to you. And, the as mentioned earlier, um, the programs that you will you know decide to enroll in will determine the type of degree you will receive. And um, to demonstrate that, let's see some examples. How will my program combinations determine the type of degree I receive? It is important to remember that the program combination you choose will affect the type of degree you get when you graduate. To get a better understanding of how your program affects your degree type, let's look at three different students who have enrolled in different programs. Our first student has enrolled in a chemistry major, which is a science program, and a biology major, which is also a science program. The degree she will receive is an honors bachelor of science. Our next student has enrolled in a history major, which is an arts program, as well as a philosophy minor and a sociology minor, which are also both arts programs. Therefore, the degree he will receive is an honors bachelor of arts. Our last student, on the other hand, has enrolled in an English major, which is an arts program, and a psychology major, which is a science program. In this case, he has a choice of either receiving an Honours Bachelor of Science or an Honours Bachelor of Arts. All right, um, so you can see how, you know, the different types of combination of the different programs that you decide to combine would make up your degree type. Um, and so that when, when you when, when it comes to choosing your program, there are three steps that you need to take. Um, the first step is to explore. Um, can't stress this uh, enough because first year is your, you know, is, is your best time to explore all the academic options um, that you have. There are over 180 programs to choose from. And um, you, it, you know, again, you might, you might, have, you might learn about programs that you haven't heard of before um, and may be interested in doing. Um, you know, we have students who might come in thinking that they want, you know, a specific program, but then they learn that there is a global leadership minor or, you know, some game studies minor that they haven't thought um, ex it, it existed. So explore your options. You have the academic calendar. Our academic calendar lists all the programs that we have. So you can actually go on each of the programs that you're interested in and um, read more about, you know, what the program is all about, you know, what courses you'll be taking towards that program and what are, you know, um, the, you know, what are the specifics about that program? So is it offered as a major or is it offered as a minor or both? Um, you know, what, what, what would you decide to do in that? You know, are you interested in doing more courses towards this program? So maybe you would then consider doing a major or specialist or are you interested in, um, you know, just taking a few courses within that program, but not maybe doing so much um, towards it. So maybe consider doing a minor in that case. And then, of course, your second step is to prepare. 
it's very important that you actually uh, prepare uh, for the program that you actually want to pursue. Uh, it's 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 good to be aware right now um, of what programs you might be interested in applying to at the end of your first year. And if you uh, go on the academic calendar, you can uh, look at the enrollment requirements or the entry requirements for your uh, desired programs and see what courses you would need to take and what requirements you need to meet to be able to request um, those programs if they're type two or type three programs um, at the end of your first year. And that takes us to the next step which is apply so once you have you know taken the you know the courses required for your program and met the you know or expect to meet the minimum entry requirements of these programs at the end of your first year then you will um you will you know declare or you will choose your programs or request them at the end of your first year once you have uh completed at least 4.0 credits or more Right, so you've heard me say some uh, something about program types, type two and type three. So we do have different types of programs. Um, not all programs have the same type. Um, we have type one programs. These type one programs are uh, have unlimited spaces. And so these programs ha are open to all students. Um, they are, um, they're, uh, they auto they're automatically approved as soon as you add them on ACORN, and they have no program entry requirements. So there are no specific courses that you need to take in your first year to be able to add these programs on ACORN. Um, when you look at type two programs, these are more competitive programs, and they have uh, while they have unlimited spaces, they also have um, entry requirements that you need to meet to me in order to um, be able to request those programs and be enrolled in them. And these entry requirements could be um, maybe, you know, completion of specific courses um, and meeting minimum grades in these courses or and or uh, a minimum CGPA um, that you need to achieve to be able to request those programs. Um, and those enrollment requirements or the entry requirements for these type for these programs are listed on the academic calendar under each program. So you'll see an enrollment requirement section um, where it lists all the you know all the required um, courses that you need to take for that program and the minimum grades or CGPA that you need to achieve um, to be able to request this program at the end of your first year and you also see type 3 programs so these type 3 programs are also competitive but they have limited spaces so Similar to type two programs, they have minimum entry requirements that you need to complete. And that could be either completion of, again, specific courses, uh, meeting minimum grades in those courses and uh, or meeting a minimum CGPA um, uh, that uh, cut off. Um, the difference between type two and type three programs is that type three programs, not only you need to meet the entry requirements, but also they're, they're so competitive and have limited spaces and, and meeting the minimum entry requirements does not guarantee entry into those programs. And uh, examples of type two and type type two programs are a bio major is a type two program. Um, uh, chemistry is a type two program as well. Um, example of a type three is um, something like our CCIT program or um, our um, commerce program computer science major or specialist programs. So these are examples of type three programs and type one programs uh, are, you know, again, these programs have, uh, they're open to all students. And an example would be uh, our geography major, for example, um, or history. Right, so apply, in terms of applying to ACORN, the difference between these different types of programs um, is that for type one programs, they these programs can be added at any time on ACORN. So as soon as you add it on ACORN, it'll become immediately active. Um, so it's automatically approved um, because it does not have any entry requirements. Um, whereas for type two and type three programs, these programs um, can only be requested uh, during our program selection period. And we only have two rounds or two times uh, for, be, uh, for our program selection periods. Um, we have round one, which is usually in the springtime at the end of the winter term. Um, and we have our round one, two, which is our summer session. And that is uh, around, uh, you know, May to June. This is, uh, sorry, around summer uh, session is in the summer and it starts from like June to August usually. Um, and invitations, once you receive invitations to those programs, um, you can, you'd have to actually go on ACORN and accept them by a specific deadline. So uh, for round one, um, 
for grand one uh, subject post applications, uh, you need to accept your invitation by uh, mid May to July, and then you, or you would also expect that departments will review your application beginning in early May, and then your round two your round two applications, um, you'd, you would you would be expected to accept your invitations in September. So that would be the deadline to accept it um, uh, once you receive um, once you receive the invitation to those um, type two and type three programs. So we have some food for thought. Um, again, take your time to explore UTM's programs and plan ahead if possible. Um, you know, ask yourself this question: Are there specific courses that you need to take? What are you know the court? What what are these courses? Check the academic calendar and make sure that you are enrolled or prioritize, prioritize these courses so that you are able to request your desired programs at the end of your first year. Um, so, you know, I, and, and feel free to explore different programs outside of the ones that you have in mind. Uh, you might find something that is more interesting to you and um, or combine different programs as well. And, you know, it is okay to change your mind. So you're not stuck in those programs. Um, once you, you know, if you think that, you know, you've tried to program a few courses within that program and, you know, feel that, um, you know, this, this is not the right program for you. Um, or maybe you've tried elective courses or distribution requirement courses and feel that this would be these, you know, doing a program within that would be a better fit for you. Then that is perfectly normal. And that's perfectly okay. Um, or even not knowing what you want to study is also okay because sometimes, again, we don't know, you know, what would be something that is offered that we haven't even thought about. And so, again, make sure you take the time to explore. Um, first year is the perfect time for you. And a lot of the courses that you take in your first year also can, can, could count towards other programs as well. Um, so you can change um, courses and programs to, to find a good fit. And uh, at this time, I'd like to invite our peer leaders, uh, Min and Ni, to share their experiences about first year enrollment and uh, tips for new students. Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to share. And so I do agree with this food for thought. Come, came, coming to UTM, I will went with the more common approach, which is I was planning to major in biology for health science and double minor in a French and a chemistry. However, as I took the French course, I found out it was not for me. So I used that course as a um, humanities distribution credits instead. And I have took the time to explore the programs that offer at UTM and read through them. And I finally kind of fell in love with the biotechnology program and have been doing it since. So yes, my suggestion to everyone here is take the time to explore the program and do not feel afraid um, or scared to change your mind. And it is completely okay to do so. And now I would like to invite Min uh, to share if is, there is any valuable first year experience that you want to share with us. Yeah, uh, so I want to talk about one of the most stressful thing that you may encounter during your first year, and that is the wait list. So, um, my number one tip regarding being in the wait list is don't be too stressed out about it. Um, the, there is always movement in the wait list because students are planning, and uh, based on my based on my experience, most of the time the wait list changes fastly during the first two weeks of fall and winter semesters because that's when students can actually attend the classes and they will have an idea of what the classes are like, and then some of them might decide to drop the courses um, due to some reasons. And uh, so if you end up in a waitlist for a course that you definitely want, I would suggest you to stay in the waitlist a little longer and be patient and uh, monitor the waitlist and uh, don't be too stressed out about it. Yeah, so that's all I want to share. Thank you, Min and Ni. Um, so these are great tips. And um, again, it is perfectly okay to change your mind. So feel free to explore the different programs. And um, if you think that there is a better program that you know suits your interests and uh, strengths, then you can um, you know change your mind about that and pursue the new program. Um, 
and distribution requirements help you explore other program areas. So it is good that you, you do need to complete one credit in humanities, one credit in social sciences, and one credit in sciences. And that allows you to explore more about the different um, areas of study um, and you know broaden your perspectives and uh, you know program options. And um, these also count as electives. So these also count as your electives. Um, uh, so it is great that you, you know, some students may decide to take these distribution requirements in their first year so that, um, so that, you know, that allows you to broaden the different options that you have in terms of choosing programs, but you don't have to take them all in your first year. So uh, it is up to you uh, if you think that, you know, the courses that you need to take towards your program are already enough and uh, you know, uh, you, you, or, or maybe you're trying to do multiple, you know, consider different program options and you're taking courses towards, you know, required courses towards each, each of these program options and would rather just keep your distribution requirements until later, that's okay as well. It's just that we recommend you do consider taking your distribution requirements in your first year if you have, to, you know, uh, room in your timetable to do so, um, so that you can, um, uh, so that you can explore the other program areas of study. And we are here to help. So um, you're not alone in terms of, you know, this, I know there's a lot of information that we've sh we're sharing today and um, you, you, we are here to help and we also have other, you know, have program support um, during the summer to help you with this. Um, our UTM1 courses are great as well. These are first year foundations courses and they, um, they allow you to strengthen your academic skills while exploring an interesting area of, uh, or an interesting topic. We also have the launch program um, to help you with or to support your transition to UTM. Uh, we have the Office of the Registrar, so we are here to support you and we have a lot of upcoming uh, opportunities for you to connect with our academic advisors and our uh, peer leaders. Um, there is also the Career Center and a lot of students might think that it's too early to think about careers at this point. Um, but if you think about it, careers uh, and program uh, cho uh, choosing programs um, come hand in hand. So you can you have access to this resource uh, and it's never too early to connect with them to discuss your career goals and your future plans. It could be also further education plans and what would be some possible program options that would best align with your, you know, these goals. So um, it is also a resource that is available to you. And we also have the International Education Center um, that supports um, not only international students on matters such as study permit and visa and other uh, uh, support as well, but also offers and uh, support students on, uh, you know, how to, you know, get exchange opportunities or UTM abroad opportunities. So it's, it also supports or provides support for all other students um, who are looking for uh, global learning opportunities. Um, okay, so the road to graduation. So we are, you have access to many different resources and tools to help you plan and manage your academic progress from your first year all the way to graduation. Um, there are two the two most important tools um, for us to highlight to you is the academic calendar and degree explorer. So as mentioned earlier, the academic calendar is your go to to um, check um, the you know the list of programs that we have or offer at UTM. The um, you can also you know look at the enrollment requirements for you know programs that have entry requirements. You can look at the completion requirements for programs and see what courses you'll be taking uh, within a specific program of study. Um, you can also you know look at our policies and uh, the different um, uh, uh, policies um, processes that we have in terms of you know uh, what is credit no credit or. What is, uh, you know, what are my degree requirements? Um, so all of that is all included in the academic calendar. And Degree Explorer is where you would be able to track your degree um, and see how far you are from completing your degree, basic general degree and program requirements. So these are uh, very important tools that you need to uh, bookmark and, um, you know, visit very often um, and uh, continuously um, use for, during your degree at UTM and uh, throughout, you, you know, um, it, it is very recommended that you actually bookmark these two um, important tools. Um, again, as, as mentioned, D Degree Explorer is a tool that helps you track your degree at UTM. Um, I know it might be hard to see this, but it shows you how Degree uh, Explorer actually um, 
appears on um, from the student site. Um, so you can see that it lists the type of degree that you're working towards. So once you have, um, you know, enrolled in your combination of programs, you will, your degree type will change to either honors Bachelor of Arts or honors Bachelor of Science or a Bachelor of Commerce or a Bachelor of Business Administration, depending on your programs of study. And you can see how far you are from completing your degree. Um, you can also, you, it'll also list the programs that you are enrolled in and the, the requirements for each programs and what courses you're taking um, towards fulfilling each requirement. So it is, it's great to track this and it's a great tool that I really like to use and encourage students um, to use to monitor their progress um, and see what courses uh, they need to complete. So. It, it, the academic calendar lists the enrollment, the entry requirements for your programs. Degree Explorer does not. Um, so Degree Explorer only shows you the requirements that you need to complete your basic degree requirements and program requirements once you've enrolled in your programs. Um, there's also a planner tool on Degree Explorer, and it allows you to forecast which courses you will take. So it allows you to, you know, add hypothetical or potential courses um, that you plan to take in the future and see how these planned potential courses would be applied to your degree and program requirements um, and how far, you know, hypothetically how far uh, you are from graduation and completing your degree. So you can plan ahead hypothetically. So you, you don't, you, you have the option to not only plan your fall winter courses, but also future courses as well. So I encourage you to um, log into Degree Explorer to kind of use this planner. Um, and um, if you have questions about how to navigate it, we are here to support you as well. And our peer leaders are here to support you as well. Um, and we also actually have a video on uh, Degree Explorer to learn more about how to, you know, use Degree Explorer and the, it is linked through Quarka. So I encourage you to watch the videos uh, about that to help you uh, with how to use Degree Explorer so that you can um, track your progress with uh, during your time at UTM. Right, so let's talk about next steps. Um, again, explore the calendar. That's your first step. Through, take your time, explore the academic calendar and understand how to use it. You know, what information is included in uh, the academic calendar and, um, uh, and uh, what information is included in the calendar and, um, you know, what you need to get out of it. So what information is provided? What do I need to, you, you know, how do I use it? What do I need? What courses do I need to get into my, you know, desired programs? What are the requirements? Is there a minimum CGPA? So this is your first step. Then your next step would be to explore the program options. So after, you know, looking at, if they're exploring the academic calendar and, um, you know, determining what information you need out of it, explore the program options and we have the course enrollment workbook to help you guide uh to help guide you through some important questions uh about you know you're choosing your program and then explore course options so how many courses should you take you, you know once you have determined what courses you need for your programs and now you're you're you know you're you have, a, you know, maybe some idea in terms of what programs you want to pursue, then your next step would be to determine how many courses you plan to enroll in, what is a full-time course load, how do I read course codes, well, I will answer all of these questions for you. I know these are a lot of questions, but we'll answer them uh, during uh, our presentation today as well. Okay, so reading the calendar. Um, the academic calendar lists the course uh, the courses that you need to take for your programs um, and uh, as well as you know electives and distribution requirements and each course code actually provides information important information at a glance so it is a very important it's very important to um, learn how to read these course codes because it gives you information about the course where it's offered. Uh, is it offered? Is, is it a UTM course? Um, you know, is it a is it a fall term course or is it a winter course? So let's break it down. Um, I'll, I'll, I'd like to invite our peer leaders, Min and Ni, to help you with that. Hello, glad to be back here again, and thank you, Saba. Uh, I'm here to tell you one of the main skills I learned during my first year that I used many times through my academic career. Um, that is how to read a course code. A course code can contain a lot of information, uh, like 
What program does the course belong to? What level is the course? The credit value. When is being offered? Which campus is offering this course? Here we have the example EMG one o one H five F. The first three characters in any course code means the department that is offering this course. With our example, ENG stands for English, so that means the Department of English is offering this course, and also it means this is an English course. The first number in any course code means the level of study. With our example again, the ENG one one. Because it has a one, so it therefore it is a one hundred level course, and one hundred level courses are first year or introductory introductory courses. On the other end of the spectrum, we have four hundred level courses, and they will have a four, and they are the most advanced courses, and they are intended for upper year students. Together, the three digits in the middle of any course code can identify each course in the calendar, timetable, and acorn. Also, please pay close attention to the three digits because even a small change to the three digits can make all the differences between entirely two different courses. Uh, so, for example, we have ENG one one. Which is how to read critically, and we have we have ENG one two, which is how to research literature. The seventh character will tell you what the course weight is. So H stands for half credit course. If a course code has an H, then you will know that this this is a half credit course. By completing this course, you will get half credit. And the、uh, same similar to the Y, so if a course code has a Y, then you know this is a full credit course. By complete by completing this course, you'll get a full credit, which is one credit. The last number in any course code indicates which campus this course is being offered at. So with our example, ENG one one H five. Because it has a five in the last as the last number, so we know this course is being offered at the UTM campus. UTM's number is five, and、uh, if a course is offered in Saint George campus, then it will have a one as the last number, and the UTSC's number is three. Please keep in mind, you can explore courses at at other campuses. However, we recommend that you reserve your first year to UTM courses and explore in upper year. So the last letter will be either an F, or an S, or an Y. This identifies the session that the course is being offered and the academic duration of the course. F stands for first subsession. So if your course code has an F. That means this course is being offered either from September to December, or May to June. So the the course is being offered at the first subsession. S second subsession. So it's either from January to April or July to August. And then if the course code has a Y, that means the course is being offered、uh, at the entire two sessions. So. Is either from September to April or May to August. And that's the end of the course code reading. Now I want to invite my colleague Ning, who is also a student peer leader, to share to talk about the timetable builder and the academic calendar. Thank you, Min. And now that you are starting to get the hang of deciphering course code. Make sure to check out the academic calendar and note down the courses that are required for your program of study entry. So the academic calendar contains the course description, its distribution category, and any prerequisites, co-requisites,、uh, or exclusion that you would have to be aware of. And once you have noted down these courses, head over to the timetable builder and starting to put together a timetable for the school year. So the timetable has every lecture. 
practic practicals and tutorial session listed out for the school year. And it is also very interactive as it allows you to add sections as you go and notify you if there's any time conflict. And so you can also access the syllabus and view enrollment controls for each courses prior to the enrollment through the um, a timetable builder as well. And so I hope these resources will prepare you well for the upcoming enrollment date. And now I'm going to give it back to Safa, our academic advisor, for more tips and information. Thank you. Thank you, Menani. Um, so as uh, our peer leaders mentioned, um, the timetable builder is a great tool for you to you know, or ensure that you build your timetable um, ahead of the course enrollment date and ensure that you have a conflict-free schedule. It allows you to see which courses are offered for the, you know, the session in question. So for the fall winter session, um, for example, you'll be able to see what is offered during that time. The academic calendar lists all the courses that are offered, but not all courses are necessarily offered in this upcoming fall winter session. So the timetable builder actually has the course uh, in the list of the course offerings. Uh, and so check, use the timetable builder. Um, and when you find a course that you want to take on the academic calendar, check to see if it is offered on the academic, uh, on the timetable builder, build a schedule that is conflict free. And once you're happy with your schedule, um, you know, you've arranged it based on the dates that work with you. Um, there might be some lecture sections or tutorial practical sections that are uh, offered. Uh, there are multiple sections for each. So you might, you know, you can you customize your timetable the way you wish to, uh, ensuring that you have a conflict-free schedule, and then go ahead and add it to your enrollment cart on Acorn, so that when it, you know, you're all ready and prepared to enroll in these courses uh, at your enrollment start time. Um, and uh, okay, um, and it is important that if a, you know to know that if a course has a lecture tutorial and practical listed on the timetable builder, it means that you need to actually ensure you enroll in one of each. Um, so make sure you check the timetable builder and Acorn. And if a course lists, you know, a lecture and a tutorial, then you need to enroll in the lecture and tutorial. If the course lists a lecture, a tutorial, and a practical, so it lists all three, you need to make sure that you enroll in all three. Um, Sometimes, sometimes lecture, sometimes courses have multiple lecture sections or multiple tutorial practical sections. So you'll have the option to choose um, the section that works best with your schedule. So you'll need then to choose one lecture section and one tutorial section and one practical section. So make sure you, um, you know, enroll in one of each if it is listed under that course. Right, so course loads. So uh, to answer the question of how many courses do I need to enroll in? So there are some general guidelines. So if you want to be considered a full-time student, um, to be considered full-time at U UTM, you need to enroll in three credits. If you're, if you, you need to enroll in three credits or more in the fall winter. And if you're enrolled in in course in, in, point, what, in 0 0.5 to 2.5 credits in the fall winter, then you'll be considered a part-time student. Um, it's a, it's it's important to 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 know whether you do need to be a full time student or not for purposes like um, uh, you know if you're receiving student government uh, government student aid for example like OSAP um, the definition of full time might be a little bit different um, but this uh, this definition is on the basis of um, uh, from the academic standpoint. Um, uh, you do need at UTM. We defined full time as being enrolled in three credits or more in the fall winter. But for purposes such as government student loan, the, the definition of being full time might be a little bit different. So it's important to ensure what it is required for you to be considered a full time student to be eligible for uh, government student loans such as OSAP. Um, um, and also, it is important for, for example, international students to be considered to, to be in full time studies um, to for eligibility for study permit and visa purposes. And we actually have support for international students um, at UTM to answer any of these questions that you might have about that. Um, so our UTM's International Education Center offers free immigration advising and programming support for all international students. And that includes immigration advising. So if you have questions about you know, study permit visas or work permit eligibility, um, they would be able to provide that support for you. They also offer transition support and programming uh, to support your transition to Canada. Um, they, they have the University Health Insurance Plan, uh, um, 
or what we refer to for short as UHIP. Um, and then we they also assist students with employment supports. And as we mentioned earlier, um, they also offer support uh, for students who are looking for global learning opportunities. So not only international students, but all other students who are interested in doing maybe an exchange uh, program at a different country or uh, doing UTM abroad courses. So uh, it's it's the uh, you, you contact the International Education Center if you have questions about that. Um, a few tips uh, to keep in mind. Uh, so the standard course load in the fall winter is at five credits for a student who wishes to graduate in four years. So if you want to complete your degree within four years without taking summer courses, um, then a standard course load would be five credits per uh, year. So in the fall winter session. Uh, many full-time students take fewer than five credits in the fall winter and enroll in summers just to lighten up their course loads in the fall winter and then pick up the credit, uh, one credit, let's say in the summer session. Um, session summer, summer is optional, so it's up to you whether you want to take summer or not. Um, we usually advise, we recommend that first year students um, enroll in 4.0 credits. Um, that allows you to and, you know, to request your programs at the end of your fall winter, uh, the end of your first year, because you do need a minimum of 4.0 credits to be able to request your programs in addition to meeting the other um, entry requirements for your programs. Um, you may maybe start with four in the fall term and see if you can, you know, maybe pick up a, a fifth course and make up, you know, other courses in the summer session if you wish to still graduate in four years. Um, uh, and it's very important to know that it is, uh, you, you need to ensure that your schedule is conflict free. You cannot be in two places at once. Um, and if you, uh, ACORN will not remove you from courses if it has a conflict. So it's your responsibility to ensure that you have a conflict free schedule. And there will be a big risk if you decide to keep that conflict because you'll be risking uh, missing important course information, assessments, or tests, and you will not be able to receive accommodations should that happen. So it's very important to know that you should ensure to have, you, sh you should ensure to have a conflict free schedule. And using the timetable builder tool allows you to, you know, flag those conflicts prior to your course enrollment date and try to work it out. Um, so you may want to maybe see if there's a different section. Um, there are multiple sections uh, offered for e for that for that course that is in conflict and and see if you can enroll in the other section that would works with your schedule. Um, or maybe prior, you know, if there is a conflict between um, a required course for your program and an elective, then uh, and there, there's no way to, you know, re resolve that conflict and uh, consider, you know, uh, prioritize the courses you need for your program and then you, um, keep the other course to, to be taken at a, you know, at a later session and switch it with a different course that, you, that works with your schedule. Um, another uh, also uh, very important tip is that you can make changes to your timetable throughout the summer with no penalty. So you can still make changes to your timetable um, as you, you know, maybe learn more uh, about the courses. Uh, but once classes begin, uh, you become responsible for any fees or academic work in the course, even if you do not attend. So make sure you drop the courses that you no longer want as soon as possible. Uh, you don't want to be in a situation where you've added a course and you forgot to drop it. And then you realize later that you failed the course. So it has academic implications um, because that course has not been dropped. And now you haven't dropped that course before the academic drop deadline. And you are uh, that, that, that the course grade, uh, even if you haven't attended, will still be impacting your academic record. And so make sure you drop the courses that you no longer need uh, or want as soon as possible. And our important dates page um, actually highlights all of our, or it has a list of all of our important academic and financial deadlines. So it's a, a very great um, a page to bookmark and refer to uh, very often to uh, confirm all the dates, uh, upcoming dates and deadlines um, in regards to adding or dropping courses. When is the last day to drop uh, or add an F or Y or S uh, course. Uh, when is the deadline to um, uh, make changes? When is the 50% deadline to drop a course? When is the academic drop deadline? So all these dates are posted on our important dates page. Um, and a frequently asked question that we have is, uh, what courses should I take? And I'm pretty sure that you all have the same question. Um, 
So it is very important to prioritize required courses for your program. So again, the academic calendar lists those courses, prioritize these courses, and then consider your interests, academic strengths, and don't be afraid to try something new. Your first year is a great time to explore and complete your electives or distribution requirements um, that you need for graduation. Um, uh, sometimes, let's say, if a student is interested in a program, um, for example, environmental um, science, uh, environment, si environmental management or environmental science, and you only, you know, the academic calendar only lists one or two courses that you need to take, and you still have room to complete the 4.0 credits minimum to be able to request your program at your first year, then do consider, you know, taking your distribution requirements and electives and um, don't be afraid to try new things um, to help you explore and learn more about yourself. Um, you'll also choose your program at the end of the winter term. So you'll have time to make, you know, explore the different programs uh, and courses and, um, you you would also have you have the time to maybe make changes to your winter term courses if you know in during the fall term you decide that some courses or you've changed your mind about your program then you'll have time to change um, your winter courses before the winter term start before the you know classes start for the winter term so that you can make that adjustment um, to be able to request your new program uh, or the new program of study that you are interested in now um, at the end of the winter term. So you 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 will have um, the opportunity to explore and um, complete your, you know, the, the, the program and your requirements uh, for your programs, again, depending on your program of study, and then request them at the end of the winter term uh, if you'd like to request them in the first round of applications. Um, Again, we also have their second round for students who may not have um, not been able to complete those program requirements in the uh, by the end of their fall winter session and decide to take summer to complete those requirements. Right, so we have a sample um, timetable. Um, so the, your timetable may be different depending on the programs that you are interested in, you know, what, what the dates that you prefer to be in classes and the sections that you choose for um, your classes. So this is just a sample just to show you of how a timetable might look like. Um, this is an example for a student who's interested in doing a biology major. So the student has reviewed the program entry requirements for the biology major on the academic calendar. And on that basis, um, the student has developed the schedule. Um, so the student has uh, has planned a Bio 152, so has enrolled in Bio 152. Um, you can see that there is a lecture section. So LEC stands for lecture, and it shows you the timing of that lecture. It might be that there were other lecture sections that are offered, but the student chose the 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. lecture section um, because it works best with their schedule. Um, you can also see that there is a tutorial section and a practical that the student enrolled in for Bio 152. The student also um, decided to take Chemistry 110 um, and um, math 132 um, to fulfill the program uh, completion requirements for the biology major um, and the student has also chose uh, the student has selected social 100 um, as an elective to fulfill their social science distribution requirement the student is interested in exploring sociology it may be that the student is considering doing a sociology minor um, and the student wants to test out and, and, and explore sociology um, to see if they're, you know, what, what the subject area is all about and also, do you know, fulfill the distribution requirement. Uh, the student also selected Spanish 100. So it's a humanities credit. It's a YS course. So you can see that this course is actually a full year course that starts from September all the way to April. So it fulfills the one credit humanities um, for the student's uh, distribution requirement. And uh, again, it might be that the student is interested in uh, learning a new language and has selected this to complete, to fulfill their distribution requirement and to um, learn more about this language. Um, so again, this is an example. Um, your timetable might be different depending on the courses you select and your programs of study. And um, it might be that the student also is also maybe interested in, again, uh, it depends on what areas of study, if you're interested in maybe fulfilling both bio and chemistry major entry requirements so that you can decide between the two or maybe combine the two, then again, look at the chemistry 
and to your requirements um, on the academic calendar and ensure that you enroll in all the other courses um, for, for the chemistry major. This is a sample of the winter term, how the winter term um, looks like. So the student has um, completed the 152 course and they will be enrolled in the 153 um, a course in this winter term. Um, and then the student would also have completed, would have completed 132 in the fall term. So that student has enrolled in 134, math 134 in the winter term. Um, and Again, the student might have uh, would have completed the Chem 110 uh, in the first term, and now the student will be completing the Chem 120 uh, in the second term. Uh, as we mentioned, Spanish is a full year course, so the course is uh, continues to the winter term as well. Um, and the student seems like this is, it seems that the student maybe found that five credit five courses in the fall was a heavy course load and decided to take just four uh, in the. Um, winter term. And that is perfectly fine. Um, so maybe the student decides to take that extra, the remaining 0.5 credit uh, in the summer. Right. So on the timetable builder, uh, it provides information about the courses. So it provides you with information such as, um, you know, course uh, under the course information, you'll be able to see what are the prerequisites for the course? What are the exclusions? What are the co-requisites? Um, you know, even the course description, what is the course uh, all about? Um, but you, uh, another piece of information that you'll find on the timetable builder that is very important for you to check is the enrollment control. Um, so basically enrollment controls limit initial enrollment to students who meet very specific criteria. And if you try to enroll in that course on ACORN, it might, tell, it might tell you that your enrollment is blocked. And if you see that message, it means that you need to check the enrollment control. But I do recommend that you check the enrollment control prior to actually enrolling in the course on ACORN so that you are able to determine if you're actually eligible to enroll in that course um, or do you need to wait until a specific time to enroll in that course. Um, if you see, there are some courses that have P enrollment controls and it means that they have a priority enrollment controls. Other certain types of students are given priority to enroll first, and after a specific date, the student will be the, after a specific date, which will be listed on this note. If you expand the explanation here, it'll show you the date. Um, this date is from July 2022, so it doesn't. Uh, this is not the exact date for this year, but you'll be able to see it on the timetable builder for this year. Um, uh, so priority, once the priority uh, en uh, enrollment is lifted, this is if you do not fall under any of these students, then you'll be able to enroll in this course uh, at this on this date uh, at the start time that is listed. Um, some courses, though, may have an R restricted enrollment control, and these courses will be restricted at all times to the students that are listed or the groups of students that are in those listed specific programs. And so if you're not yet in any of these listed programs, um, then you will not be able to enroll in that course. So it's very important to check the enrollment control for the courses you actually wish to enroll in. So aside from checking the prerequisites, the prerequisites exclusions, uh, and other uh, in the course description, it's important that you check the enrollment control on the timetable builder. So you'll see it where, you know, it lists the course, the lecture sections, and then it'll show you the enrollment control for the course. Right. So your next steps in terms of payment. Um, so once you enroll in courses on ACORN, um, that does not secure your spot in the courses. So to become registered and secure your spot in the courses, you need to make your payment or defer your fees. So the, the, you need to make the minimum payment to register. Once you enroll in courses, if you check your ACORN invoice, you'll be able to see a line that says minimum payment to register. Um, that's the amount that you actually need to pay by the minimum payment to register deadline. Um, and your payment options include um, you can either pay through your bank um, or, uh, you know, you, you may do it through online banking if you um, add University of Toronto as a payee. Uh, and there are details in terms of how to do that and what you, information you need to include um, to be able to make sure your payment is successful. Um, you can do it through the credit card on Acorn or higher ed points. All that information is posted on our on the UFT student accounts website and, uh, and on our um, registration guide. So our fall winter registration guide will provide information on how to make a payment. Um, 
Uh, also, deferral options include, so for students who are eligible to defer, um, these students could be in on the basis of a scholarship. So if you're receiving a scholarship that is equal to or greater than the minimum payment to register, that shows on your invoice, um, you are eligible to defer your fees. And for those students who are uh, receiving government student loans, such as OSAB, for example, um, these students can defer their fees to register. And the deferral process is also posted on our fall winter registration guide and the link is provided here in the banner. Great. So again, your next steps, uh, the next steps that you need to um, uh, to do in the summer uh, as you, you know, in, as you do uh, choose your courses and uh, get ready to start your classes in September. Um, choose your courses on your at the start of uh, your enrollment start time. Uh, you do need to choose your courses for both the fall and winter term courses. You can still make changes, as mentioned, depending on what, um, you know the deadline for each F, Y, and S courses. Um, so check the important dates page to see when is the last day to make those changes for uh, fall fall term, Y term, Y uh, full year courses and uh, winter term courses. Enroll into them as soon as possible. I know you have time to enroll in your winter term courses and make changes, but it, courses do fill up quickly. So enroll into them as soon as possible. Um, and then again, you can make changes as necessary uh, before the last day to make changes or add or drop courses. Um, you have to then once you enroll in your courses, pay or defer your fees. So complete your registration to become so you need to have your status on acorn changed from invited to registered to secure your spot in courses. And you can do so by paying your fees or deferring your tuition fees once they are available on ACORN and um, obtain your T-card and uh, activate your U of T account. So book a T-card appointment to gain access to U of T's to student services, uh, including your university email, Wi-Fi access and more. Um, right. So, um, of course, you can connect with us if you have any questions. Uh, we are uh, located, this is our, the Office of the Registrar is located in the Innovation Complex. That's our address. And that's our um, general uh, phone line number. And you also have our website and the new students um, page, which has a lot of information about, um, uh, you know, what you need to know about choosing courses, selecting programs, um, and also links uh, to our events and webinars. So we have a lot of upcoming opportunities for you to connect with us. Uh, we have uh, a, a course enrollment webinar um, taking place uh, in the next few days. Uh, we also have our um, check-in sessions. We have, you, uh, I also encourage you to um, join and connect with your Eagle Connect squads where you can get a lot of information about um, uh, being at UTM, choosing your courses, and uh, other useful information. So uh, sign up for events and webinars in uh, on our uh, new student page. Uh, the link is provided here in the chat. And now we'll have um, plenty of time to address any of the questions that you have during our Q&A uh, period. So I'd like to invite our um, my colleague Dre and our two PE leaders back to our um, session. Thank you. Great. All right, I think our questions will pop up on the screen. I'll, I'll read it out to you guys and see who wants to take it. So the first question comes from Burfin. How many additional years can you take? Is there a time limit beyond four years? And how does this affect admission to grad studies? Does it have an effect? Hey, that's a good question. Um, so for university purposes at UTM, there's no limit to graduation. Um, so a student can take more than four years to complete their degree. Um, a student can even uh, take a break after, you know, that maybe a student would have completed a one year or two years of study and needs to take time off um, uh, for personal reasons or health reasons, for example, and decides to resume their studies at a later session. That is still possible as well. Again, there's no limit to graduation for that purpose. Um, it may be uh, good to check with if you're a student receiving OSAB or other student government funding, um, you may want to check to see um, if a uh, taking time to complete your degree might have any impact or implications on eligibility to receive further funding. Uh, so that's something to check with your financial aid advisors. Um, 
Uh, but for UTM purposes, um, there's no limit to uh, when you can graduate. And how that may impact admissions to graduate studies, um, it depends on the grad school and if they have any requirements uh, about that. So it may be best to um, check with them directly if they do have a requirement of completing your degree within a specific timeline. All right, next question. Is it okay if I have two classes right after one another and they're in different buildings and I have a five minute walk? How can I get to my next class? Do one of our students want to take that question? Yeah, so uh, for, to address this question, uh, there's a, a thing called UTM time. So every lecture or tutorial or protocol, they will actually start 10 minutes after the scheduled time. So for example, if a course says it starts at 11 a.m., the, and the instructor will actually lecture in the course uh, at 11.10. So we are, we are give, so the UTM is giving 10 minutes for students to walk around building, from buildings to building. Great, we'll move on to the next one. On July 19th, what time should we log in? Is it important to be early? Maybe That's you're- true. Yeah. So uh, you can check the at the start time of your course enrollment on July 14th. And uh, based on my experience, it's always 8 a.m. <laughs> and uh, I would suggest you to be ready to log in at the exact 8 a.m. because you will be blocked from logging into a uh until it's 8 a.m. So what I usually do is that I sit in front of my laptop at uh, 7 .50 .50 oh sorry 55 and then i will click logging the moment that you reach is at 8 a.m <laughs> all right next question if you got admitted to a certain program biology for health science that you want to change to biotech um can you transfer by taking the needed courses yeah, that's a great question. Um, so yes, as mentioned earlier, it's okay to change your mind um, about programs. Uh, you are only admitted to a stream, uh, but you, if you're interested in pursuing different programs, then make sure you check the academic calendar and ensure that you uh, meet the entry requirements. So you take the required courses for these programs that you're now interested in, including any high school prerequisites. So that's a very important piece of information. Uh, for example, psychology, uh, our psychology program is a major program, uh, is a science program, and uh, it does have high school prerequisites that students must have um, to be able to pursue the program uh, in addition to the courses that they need to take at UTM in their first year. And so it is very important to check the academic calendar to ensure that if you're looking to switch your program uh, outside of the stream that you were admitted to, um, then ensure that you have the high school prerequisites uh, for these programs as well. And I would say with a lot of programs um, in the life science field, your core first year courses are going to be pretty similar and pretty much the same in a number of different programs. So at the end of the first year, you have the option to decide for bio for health science, for example, and biology and or biotechnology. So I think a lot of those core first year courses are going to be very similar, but do double check in case there is a difference. What course load do you recommend for first year students for the fall winter um, term full time? It's, would five courses be too much or would it be manageable? Um, so I'm going to take this one. I think my advice would be um, see what works for you. So five can be a lot for some students. It can be totally manageable for others. It's important that you think about what you have going on in your life. Do you have a part time job? Do you have family responsibilities? Do you have a big commute? Um, so think about all of those factors um, and maybe our students can comment on what they did in their first year and how it worked out. So um, what works best for me is always within the four to five courses per semester. So during my first year, it was online because it was during COVID time. And so it was more manageable as, as um, I do not have to commute to the school and it's mostly happened online, so um, yeah. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't during my first year. It can be like overwhelming because of the assignments, the number of assignments, and then the contents are being covered. So I would suggest 
stay in four or five courses and do not like go to six, even though it is like possible. And your a lot of programs have a GPA requirement, so it's really important that you get the best possible marks in your first year. Um, so if that means taking four courses in your first year and that's how you're going to get the best marks, that might be the best decision. All right, next question. What's the difference between CGPA, sorry, GPA, CGPA, and AGPA? And there is a difference. Yes, that's a great question. I'll take that. Um, so grade point average is um, basically the average of the, um, so uh, your your percentage grades uh, for each course is actually, um, it is um, translated to a grade point average. And the average of all these grades is actually makes up your grade point average. And CGPA means it is your cumulative grade point average. So it accounts for all the courses that you complete at UTM uh, from the start of your studies until the end, uh, ex for the exception of courses that uh, or credits courses that you would um, uh, so, uh, apply uh, credit no credit for, for example, um, or that courses that you late withdraw from. Um, but other all failed and past courses will be included in your cumulative GPA or what we refer to as CGPA. And annual GPA is basically your grade point average during the fall winter session. So your first at the end of your first year, your CGPA will be the same as your annual GPA uh, at the end of the fall winter session. Um, but as you, you know, enroll in your second year and third year, your cumulative GPA will account for all the grades that you have taken since your first year studies. Um, but your annual GPA would be a particular uh, the grade point average for that particular fall winter session all right next question can you apply for post at other u of t campuses okay so the answer is no um unfortunately if you are registered at utm you would have to uh, enroll in programs that are offered at UTM. If you're interested in programs outside of UT UTM, then you would have to apply for an internal transfer to the other UFT campus. Um, but you will then no longer be a UTM student if you are if your internal uh, transfer application is accepted. So you can only enroll in the in in, in programs that are offered at your um, the, at the at the campus that you registered in. All right. We'll look for our next question. It's from Gina. In the time table builder, it said we must enroll in the same number code for tutorial and practical for some courses, but I found that it has a conflict. Is this normal? How do I enroll? Yes. So um, I think an example is Physics 136. Um, the tutorial, it is, it, it, there is a note on the timetable builder that if you enroll in one um, in, in the tutorial section, you'd have to enroll in the relevant practical section as well. Um, and the timetable builder does not, uh, isn't able to identify that. So it'll, it'll flag that as a conflict, but that's okay in that case. If there is a note um, that says that on the timetable builder, you can then ignore that conflict. All right, let's see what's next. What happens if I don't get into my program of choice? Um, so we did go over how some of our programs are more competitive than others, and they have certain grade point averages or certain marks, et cetera, that you need to achieve in your first year. And yes, sometimes students do not get into their first choice program. Um, so that's kind of a loaded question and um, probably needs some more individual advising. So sometimes you can try again. So you may repeat a course and try to get into the program again. Um, sometimes it means changing direction, so looking at another program. Um, so like we said, a lot of your first year courses will qualify you for multiple programs. Um, so you may in fact have prerequisites for something else. Um, so it is important to keep an open mind and to have maybe a backup plan in case your first choice does not work out. All right, if I wanted to take either my social science or humanities credit in second year, would I have to take a first year course then? Um, not necessarily. Um, so it is okay to take first year courses in your upper year uh, if you're in second year or third year. It's still okay to take uh, humanities as a course um, to satisfy your distribution requirement that is a first year course. Um, you don't need to take it in your first year. Um, but if you are looking to take upper year 
um, courses to satisfy your social science or humanities credits, you can also do so as long as you satisfy the prerequisites, um, uh, prerequisites and exclusion requirements, So, and, and as, uh, as well as the enrollment controls. So check that information if the course that you plan to take does not have an, you know, pre any prerequisites, or if you do have the prerequisites, um, then you can enroll in that course as well. Okay, here's a question from Blue Moon. Is it better to take integral difficult different calculus or life science or the normal calculus? Is there a big difference between them? Yeah, that's a very common question um, that we get from first year students. Um, and the question is, which math course do I enroll in? Um, we do have multiple math, first year math courses. Um, and it depends on what programs you want to uh, pursue. And some math courses are open to students who've been only admitted to certain streams. Um, so Math 132 and 134 are for students who have been admitted to the life sciences streams. Um, and so these, cor these, these uh, courses are open to students who've been admitted to these streams. Um, but if uh, a student is interested in um, taking the general calculus courses, um, Math 135 and 136, they're still able to, to, to do so. Uh, and these courses will also satisfy the um, requirements for you know, programs like biology. Um, but also, the, you can also use these courses towards other programs of study. Um, Math 133 is only open for students who've been admitted to say to commerce or management streams. And so you won't be able to have that option to, to take the course. And um, it may be that some, you know, this course might not be uh, acceptable towards um, students interested in uh, the sciences streams. Um, so you, it's, it's good to look at the programs that you're interested in. I know sometimes, uh, let's say if you're interested in doing a math major or math specialist, then the math course that you would take would be uh, different. And so if, if you're looking to combine programs and both programs require a calculus course, see which, uh, you know, is there a common course that you can take um, that would be acceptable, you know, is there which math course would be acceptable towards both programs so that you can enroll in that math course. Are there any tips or methods you discovered in your first year that helped you do well in following years? I'll throw that out to our students. Um, so, sorry. No, no. <laughs> you know, for, for me, the most helpful tip would definitely that I, I found out that if I book an appointment uh, with RGAC in advance of the due dates of my assignment, then I will get a high marks on my assignment. <laughs> So, so the RGAC yeah. is the Academic Skills Center, just yeah. in case you didn't understand the acronym. Yeah, so the RGAC stands for the Robert Gillespie Academic Skills Center, and uh, it's a skill center that you can book in person or online appointment with, uh, with the, the, the instructors and the, some professional people, and they can help you with your essay writing, math, math skills, and uh, study tips. So if you have any like deadlines or exams or project or some assignments coming up and then you can book an appointment then, then they are super helpful. For me is um, to look at the syllabus before class start so that I know what is the grade distribution look like and also uh, what topics gonna be cover and if I find a certain topic is like more challenging than the other ones, then I will spend more time during that week that is being taught uh, more on it. And then, yeah, I think that's uh, the syllabus. It's just good to have a construct a schedule for yourself to study and be ready like for the exam towards the end. Great, great advice. All right. I would like to book a one-on-one -on -one meeting with an academic advisor. How do I do that? Okay. Um, so we, uh, we, if you have questions, um, uh, you know, about choosing your courses, um, we have multiple opportunities for you to speak with an academic advisor. Um, we ha will have um, check-in sessions during the summer where you can actually uh, drop in to ask your questions uh, about 
you know, any questions that you have about course enrollment or other questions. Uh, and you'll also have, um, uh, you know, the opportunity to also um, check in with our peer leaders about, you know, being a student at UTM and other support services that are available. Um, we do have, uh, if you want to book an appointment, uh, we do have um, a system called Ask Registrar. It's a portal that where students submit um, questions through uh, or request for an appointment. Um, and, and during the summer, we are uh, busy running all you know the course enrollment webinars and the check-in sessions. So we, uh, it would be best to uh, not submit a ticket uh, at this time, uh, as you will not be able to receive as fast a response. Uh, and we'd recommend you to actually um, join us for one of our check-in sessions. Um, yeah, we have a session almost yeah. every day this yes. summer. So it would be much quicker to talk to an advisor by popping into one of these um then by trying to wait for an appointment yeah. so definitely attend some of our summer programming and all of that's found on that new student um, website if we could put up a link for that that would be great yeah, yeah. i would just want to also note that the eagle connect checking session are actually coming up next week and we have uh, um like two to three checking session every day so yeah, if you haven't yet connected with your Eagle Connect squad, um, I would highly encourage you to do so. It's a chance to connect with other people in your in your subject area, um, with upper year students, academic advisors, faculty members, all sorts of people will be popping into those sessions throughout the summer. Um, so if you hadn't had a chance to connect, it's not too late. You can still do that, and that's open all summer long. All right. Whoops. Okay. Is the July 19th the only day to enroll, or is that the start of the enrollment period? Yes, that's the start of your enrollment period, um, and your uh, uh, your st assigned start time. So your start assigned start time will um, be posted on July 14th, and then make sure you prepare, you know, and add all your courses to your enrollment card so that you can start on July 19th to enroll in your courses. It's just that classes do fill out quickly, courses do fill out quickly, so it would be best to enroll at you know, on July 19th uh, at your aside time, but if you still have time during the summer to make changes. So you have up until the last day to make changes to your um, fall term and full year courses, which is September 19th. Um, so that's the uh, enrollment period time, uh, but the start would be July 19th. And you probably wanna finalize your classes before the you know beginning of classes so that you are, ready to start your classes in September. All right, here's a question from Debbie. My post is biology for health science. Does that mean my ma does that mean that's my major and I need two minors? Can I have just one major and not take minors or have a specialist? So I can take this one. So having um, a major in bio health science is not enough to carry your degree. So you can do a couple of things. You can combine it with another major or you can decide to do two minors if you prefer. If you specialize in something, you don't need any other program to go with it. Um, so yes, um, that major is just not enough to carry your degree. So explore with your electives, see what other minors or other major you might like to pursue. This one comes from Marij. Can you take three courses in year two? Um, okay, so you can take whatever courses and whatever course load that works best for you. Um, it's important to consider, though, if you are an international student, um, need, do you need to maintain a full-time study, a full-time credit load? Um, three courses um, in the fall, three courses in the winter, that's 1.5 credit each term, and that is three credits, and that uh, you would still be considered a full-time student. So if you decide to do that, um, it is it is up to you. Um, you control your own schedule. You control your own course load. Um, so it is possible for you to enroll in three courses in year two. Um, but again, keep in mind um, what um, you know whether you do need to maintain a specific course load uh, for purposes such as government student aid or uh, study permit purposes or other purposes uh, or maybe maybe maintaining eligibility for a scholarship. So that's very important to consider. Yeah. I want to clarify that uh, you can take courses, uh, no, so so you don't have to take courses that's during the year that's referring to the level of study. So you can take um, 
300 level courses uh, at your second year at UTM, or you can even take you can even take 100 level courses at your last year at UTM. So as long as you can complete the prerequisite for the course, then you can enroll in the courses. What is the best way to ensure that you get into your specialist program other than a minimum GPA? Are there clubs, extracurriculars that can increase your chances of getting in? Yes. Um, so maybe a uh, very um, uh, like an, an, a quick answer would be to attend your classes. Um, if you you know you're, you once you're enrolling your courses, you want to ensure that you attend your classes. That's very important to do so. This is where you'll learn uh, content about your courses and that would help you improve your CGPA and performance in your courses. Um, but there are clubs and um, extra curriculars that you can actually get involved with. Um, and maybe I'll pass it on to our peer leaders to uh, maybe point to a few, um, you know, w maybe where a student can find um, or register for such things. So at the first week of the school year there will be a two to three days club fair going on in the cct atrium and i have found a lot of opportunities by attending the fair and it is open to any every student and if you happen to have an hour free slot in between classes make sure to drop drop by and check out the table and find the courses that you are most, most interested in and i think every club would have a sign up sheets right there ready and you can write down your name as well as email to subscribe to their uh, newsletter for any opportunities and so on. Yeah. And I would also suggest uh, that definitely put your focus on your GPA, on your courses. So uh, so joining a club or having some like extra curricula is like a add-on points. But the GPA is the most important thing if you are applying to the Type 3 program. So I could give you an idea of what it looks like. So I have some friends who applied to the uh, Commerce program. They are also Type 3 program do, uh, like during their first year. And the, the GPA cutoff at that time, I think it's um, 2020, is, uh, was 3.3. .3. And for my program, uh, I applied for the DM. Uh, also, at uh, at the twenty twenty two, oh sorry, twenty twenty twenty, and the the GPA cut off is um two point nine. So, yeah, definitely focus on your GPA and the courses. More. If I have to make a payment. August 16th, but I'm not receiving my scholarship by September, should I defer my payment? Yes. Um, so if your scholarship amount is equal to or greater than the minimum payment to register that shows on your invoice, then um, yes, do defer your, your fees um, by the deadline so that you ensure that you um, are registered and secure your spot in your courses. Uh, your status on ACOR needs to change from invited to registered. And there are as mentioned, there are two ways to do so by making the minimum payment to register or by deferring your fees. And if you expect if your scholarship amount is equal to or greater than the minimum payment to register, then do defer your fees. Um, and once the scholarship is applied in September, it'll it'll automatically be applied to your Acorn account to um, to, to to your pay, to your tuition fees. Um, but if your your scholarship amount is less than your uh, minimum payment to register, then make the minimum payment to register. And then when um, the scholarship is applied in September, it'll be applied to whatever remaining fees um, that you have on your invoice. Uh, but it, and if all of the fees have been paid, then your scholarship will be um, uh, refunded back to you. And there's there uh, it would be best to include your direct deposit information on Acorn so that. Uh, if there, the scholarship needs to be refunded to you, it'll be directly deposited to your bank account. Uh, that's the fastest method. Otherwise, it'll be sent to by a, by check uh, to your, the mailing address we have for you on Acorn. So again, also make sure that you ha always have your mailing address up to date um, in case the university needs to send a refund or a letter. Um, so make sure you update your um, mailing address on Acorn. Great. 
What would you recommend someone do if they get waitlisted for a prerequisite course? Should they wait or enroll in another course? Who wants yes. to take this one? Okay, I think I think I can take this one. So there's a, a few different scenarios. So let's say if this is a prerequisite course, and do you have any other options? So if you do, and if the other options they have available spots. I would suggest you to definitely enroll in other options. And uh, if this is a course that you must have, uh, and uh, I would suggest you to stay in the wait waitlist a little bit longer and be patient because there's always movement in the waitlist. And, uh, and also, so let's say if you are far behind the waitlist, let's say uh, this course has only like 60 spots mm -hmm. and uh, you are in the number 32 in the waitlist, Maybe what you can do, what I did was I, I had a similar situation before. And what I did is that I emailed the department and I said that, OK, so um, we can tell there's a huge demand for this course. Uh, do you have any plan to open another session for this course? And uh, they reply back like, oh, OK, they are closely monitoring the waitlist and uh, they will let us know if they open that session. And then it turned out they did open that session. So. Uh, if it's like a prerequisite course for a lot of students, I would I believe they will make uh, some adjustment, perhaps, but but yeah. be a little patient mm -hmm. <laughs> in the wait list. Yeah, as, as, as mentioned, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So keep in mind that the students have you know they have you know they may be changing their mind during the summer and wait lists can you know change uh, during the summer as students make their course selections. Um, so be patient um, and again, closely monitor ACORN and the timetable builder. Sometimes you see on the timetable builder, there are sessions or sections that are scheduled, uh, but there, but when you hover over to add it to your timetable builder, it says um, activity and available. It means that this, you know, the departments have reserved some sections and they're closely monitoring the wait list to see if um, there's a need to open up these sections. So they may or may not open up these sections, um, but monitor ACORN and um, the timetable builder closely so that in once in and if um, these sections are open, you can uh, uh, enroll in these sections uh, before they get filled. Okay, question comes in. When I add certain courses to ACORN, this comes up. The following activity in person requires approval to enroll from the offering division and or instructing faculty member. What is the mean? Yes, yeah, so if you check the enrollment control for the court for this course, um, you'll be able to see what type of enrollment control it has. Some courses may have AP, or uh, meaning that the course requires departmental approval and uh, has also priority enrollment control. So again, depending depending on the course, some courses um, may, such as ISP 100, for example, if a student is trying to add this course, uh, ACORN will allow you to add it, but it will say interim until the department has had a chance to either approve you enter the course or refuse you. Again, depending on the criteria that they use to see which student is eligible to enroll. So if you have questions about eligibility to enroll in a course, um, you can contact the department offering the course directly. Um, again, check the timetable builder under enrollment controls and you'll find out um, the, the, you know, what, what information you need to know. Sometimes these cor some courses may recall approval and cannot be added on ACORN. So it's only the department that can add these courses um, for you. Uh, so that will also be mentioned on the timetable builder. And I would say that's typically for upper year courses. For most first year courses, you shouldn't face this problem except for ISP 100. And in that specific case, they want you to do a language assessment before they add you into a section um, just to make sure you're in the right section. So um, don't panic, um, that's normal. Okay, if we are out of province students, when would we hand in our end of year transcripts and how? I think it would be best to contact the admissions office um, and with to, to answer this question um, to see what would be the deadline to submit your transcripts. Um, yeah, and the link is provided there.
Are there any first year courses that are one full credit instead of 0 0.5? So when you're looking at the timetable, you'll see some courses listed as a Y course. Those are generally speaking full credit courses. Um, Psych 100 is the first one that comes to mind, um, but you'll need to do a bit of a dig. Um, but yes, I, I would say the majority of our courses are offered as half courses um, or one semester courses, um, and sometimes with a part one and a part two. So for example, like Math 135, you would do in first semester, 136 you would do in second semester. Um, but there are still instances of full year courses. Forensics 239, for example, is also a full year course. So they are out there, it's just maybe not as common. Where do I find the required courses for my program? Psych. Yes, so um, you'll find it on the academic calendar. So if you click, go on the academic calendar, click on list of programs, and under P, you'll be able to see psychology. So if you click on that, you'll see all the programs that are offered under the psychology department. Um, so depending on what you're planning to pursue, is it a psychology major or a specialist, you'll be able to click on the um, program of choice and the concentration tab that you wish to do. And then that will expand, um, you know, the information for that program. Enrollment requirements. So the required courses will be listed under the enrollment requirements section under that program. And it's very, it's a, it's a very good um, actually um, question because uh, sometimes if a student, let's say, is doing a biology major, um, it lists that bio 152 and 153 is our, our program requirements, but it recommends taking chemistry uh, 110, 120, uh, math 132, 134 uh, in their first year, in, in first year. Uh, but these are listed actually as completion requirements. So while it is recommended that you do them in first year, um, they're not listed as enrollment requirements, they're listed as their completion requirements. So if you're having a Conflict, maybe um, in one of these courses is conflict in, prioritize the courses that are required and then take the recommended courses um, if, if they can fit in your schedule. Because again, a lot of chemistry and math are also required for other possible, you know, program options. Um, uh, or if you're looking to do a biology specialist, um, uh, then you might want to consider completing those in first year so that you can broaden your options. Okay, we got a question from Simon, and I think we're going to probably have to end soon. So let's take a look at this question, maybe one more. I'm sorry, you seem to have skipped my question. Do I apply for the specialist program needing 10 credits at the end of my second year? I'm looking at the neuroscience program. So there are a few exceptions where there are some specialist programs that require, it's usually eight credits, so two years of study, um, and some 200 level courses before you can apply for this. Um, so something like the neuroscience program, at the end of your first year, we would suggest you apply to psychology and biology um, so that you get priority enrollment into those upper year psych and bio courses. And then at the end of your second year is when you apply to your specialist. Um, so that's how you would do it for a program like this. Okay, maybe one last question and then we're going to have to wrap up. All right, this is from Harleen. What if there's a prerequisite I don't meet for a specific course as an enrollment requirement? What if I don't have, for instance, Chem 110 needs 70% or higher in grade 12? And what if you don't have it? Yeah, hey, that's a great question. So prerequisites are um, required to ensure that you have the necessary um, preparation to be able to be successful in the course. And so um, you do need to have the prerequisites um, to be able to enroll in a course. Now, ACORN will actually not remove you uh, or prevent you from enrolling in a course that you don't have a prerequisite for, but departments do check for prerequisites and actually eventually remove a student who, uh, from the class, from a course um, uh, if the student does not meet the, pre the necessary prerequisites. So if you have questions uh, or think that you may have um, an equivalent to the uh, prerequisite, you may contact the department to confirm. Otherwise, you, uh, your option would be to either, you know, maybe consider doing the prerequisite, um, uh, uh, you know, through virtual high school, for example, or through other means, um, uh, maybe by, con you know, if you're, if, uh, by, by doing it um, through your, um, region, um, 
adult education programs or some other programs and uh we if you can you can contact us so that we can provide you with a possible with a few with a possible list of where you may be able to do so um and uh, once you have completed the necessary prerequisites, then you'll be able to, to enroll in um, the courses that require them. Okay, I was wrapping up too soon. We finished at 12. So definitely we have time for more questions. So if you haven't had your question answered, please re-put it in the chat so we don't miss it. Um, here's a great one. Where can I get a recorded version of this live stream? So right after this session, um, it will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, so you can watch it right away if you really want to, um, or come back to it um, as you're going through your course planning and maybe you come up with some questions and want to um, re-look re at the session. Okay, can I do a major with one minor or does it have to be two minors? Yes, so uh, you do you do need to complete a minimum combination programs to be able to complete your degree at UTM, and that is either one specialist or two majors or a major and two minors. So you, unfortunately, you cannot just complete a major and one minor. So you'll have to do either uh, two majors or a major and two minors or a specialist. All right, what if I wanted to switch from chemistry um, to outside of the sciences, for example, switch to commerce. Um, would I take both degree prereqs in first year? Um, so I think it would be important to decide which program you want to do more, because um, I don't know if it's possible to take all of the requirements in your first year. Do you, what do you think? Oh, maybe you can, because math is an overlapping requirement. Um, I have something to say. So the required course to apply for the commerce program they are uh, highly competitive so the, the space the spots do fill out very qu quickly and uh, they also have priority control for students who are already admitted this, to this program so yeah it's a little bit unlikely to get all of the required course uh, for those two programs during the first year but you can try <laughs> Yeah, you may consider maybe taking one three um, one math one three five and one three six um, so that it can count towards both programs, um, and you'll still have to do eco one hundred one, eco one hundred two, MGM uh, one hundred one, MGT one twenty, and uh, also take Chem one ten one twenty and ISP one hundred. So you 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 are required to take all these um, courses. So it's still possible um, to switch uh, if you're still undecided and you want to take both, um, but it would be best to kind of at least consider um, what co what program you are leaning more towards and then can take courses towards that option. So if you're really looking to switch to commerce, then you know, look at the academic calendar under enrollment control uh, and requirements for commerce and see what courses you would need to take in your first year to be able to request this program at the end of your first year. And though, even though you were admitted into the sciences, you can absolutely change your mind and pursue a, a completely separate program. So it's definitely possible. You might also check the enrollment controls for these courses, Eco 101, Eco 102, MGM 101, and uh, because it might be that commerce the students who have been admitted to the commerce streams have uh, priority enrollment controls. And so uh, you would have to wait until all of these students have enrolled and after a certain date when priority enrollment is lifted, this is when you would be able to enroll in these courses. Um, so definitely check the enrollment controls. All right, next question. When will I know which of my credits have been accepted for transfer? So that sounds like you might be a transfer student, so you may have studied elsewhere or you have some high school transfer credits. Um, you will get a transfer assessment. Um, if you're transferring from another um, institution, um, there was a session we did yesterday um, that you can view on our YouTube channel to learn more about that transfer credit process. If you have some high school credit transfers, those will be assessed automatically. Um, I don't know when you find out, do you know? Um, the assessment will be sent to you um, by our transfer credit office. So just uh, monitor your email and uh, it'll, you'll receive an assessment um, once that's done. And you'll also see it reflect on ACORN um, under your you know, academic history. So you'll see whether you've been awarded any um, transfer credits. 
if you do not fulfill the requirements by the deadline of applying for a specialization, do you have to apply next year? Um, yeah, so it's quite common sometimes that people don't get into their program after the end of their first year. So they may take a summer course um, and then apply in the second round. Or sometimes it means that they're taking courses in their second year and then they, they apply at the end of their second year. Um, you are expected to apply for a program once you have four credits or you're about to have four credits. Um, so if you're going at a slower pace, it may take you longer. Um, and we, we just saw an example where some specializations actually require you to have two years of study. So in which case you would apply for a major, maybe in that same area, and then specialize in your second year. Don't worry, we will have more sessions about applying to program though throughout the year. So you're, you're thinking way ahead, um, but, but good to be asking questions. All right, I want to do my post as a physiology specialist and would I need to take prerequisites at St. George or would I take similar courses at UTM internally transferring after my first year? Um, if you're looking to do an internal transfer, um, you'd, uh, I would suggest that you contact uh, the admissions office at St. George campus to inquire about um, the possibility of doing an internal transfer to their program. Some programs may not allow students uh, uh, from you know, transferring from a different campus to do these programs, such as the computer science program, for example. Um, so double check with the admissions office to see if it's possible to pursue that program. Um, and check with the department at St. George to see if the UTM courses you'll be taking towards your UTM program would be applicable um, towards their own programs as well. Um, uh, if you're, you might also want to maybe check with the UTM department uh, for the program that you wish to pursue at UTM if, in case your internal transfer application is not accepted uh, to see if you decide to take courses at St. George, would these courses be uh, applicable or acceptable towards your UTM program? So you may be best to connect with both departments at UTM and St. George to see what would be the best, best course of action in this case. If you do transfer, your, your credits from UTM do show up with a grade um, and there is often an equivalent. Um, there are some, some exceptions, um, but yeah. Can you please explain the deferred payment method for OSAP students? Yes, yeah, so if a student is re um, receiving government student aid such as OSAP, uh, we know that usually the funding will not be released until mm -hmm. beginning of classes, and that's usually after the date to pay or defer your fees. Um, so the, uh, it's usually after the payment deadline, and that allows you, so we, we have a process where you are uh, eligible to defer your fees fees um, on this basis so that you can register without making the minimum payment to register if you do successfully defer your fees on this on the basis of OSAB or scholarship. And then once um, the, the, the funding is, is released, um, then you would need to make your to ensure that you uh, if the uh, you need to ensure that your payment uh, is made. And that is either, uh, let's say if you're you still have outstanding fees on ACORN, you haven't made uh, all the pay, the the full payment, then your OSAP funding will be, you know, automatically directed to your tuition fees. If you've already made the fees, then your OSAP funding will be refund or redirected to your bank account. Um, but you are responsible for ensuring that you make your payment once your funding is released to avoid service charges. So uh, October fifteenth is usually our service charge billing date. So you need to ensure that the payment is. Uh, received before that date, uh, even if you have successfully deferred your fees um, to avoid any service charges on your outstanding balance. Um, so the earlier you apply for OSAP, the better so that you can ensure to receive your funding uh, as early as possible um, so that your payment can be paid before the service charge billing date. And the process to defer is actually on ACORN. So you'd go on ACORN and defer your fees um, if you're receiving OSAP, uh, it'll be there. The instructions are posted on our fall winter registration guide. So make sure you go on the fall winter registration guide and the instructions on how to defer your fees will be there. So if I got into forensics and I want to do environmental science instead, I just take the enrollment requirements for what I want to switch to and then apply at the end of that year. Yes, basically. So if you no longer have an interest in pursuing forensics, you're going to take the first year requirements for the program you're most interested in. 
And if you're interested in both, take both so you have a backup. You can be creative um, in terms of how you would like to combine your programs. So there's no right or wrong answer. Um, it, you can do it whichever way that works best for you. Okay, in Degree Explorer, it's showing issues found with a year math course. The issue is high school algebra. algebra. Why is this an issue? You might want to uh, check to see if you have the necessary high school prerequisite or maybe the minimum grade required um, for the course. Uh, if you believe that you do have the high school prerequisite and the minimum grade required, then uh, maybe it could be a glitch in the system. So it would be best to double check with uh, the math department to confirm that you have the necessary prerequisite. Can I pay only the minimum amount to register minus my scholarship? What if someone can't manage the payment to register and wait for return of scholarship? Um, so the minimum payment to register is usually um, your fall term fees. Um, that's that's the minimum payment to register. Um, uh, so you'll see it appear on your invoice, and um, whatever scholarship you you if whatever the amount of your scholarship that would that would um, allow you to see whether you sh you can defer your fees or not. Um, so if you can pay the minimum amount to register, um, that's what you need to pay. Uh, you don't need to pay the rest of your fees uh, at this uh, at the August uh, on the August deadline. You know the August 16th deadline. So you would just have to be responsible for making the minimum payment, and then when the scholarship is a you know is um, in September is applied, it'll be applied to any remaining fees. And uh, if uh, there's any remainder that you know um, that you know you you've already paid your fees or there is still a scholarship that hasn't been applied to the fees because you've paid the majority of the fees and the scholarship will be uh, refunded to you. So you do not need to make the full payment uh, by the minimum payment to register. What you will be responsible for is the minimum payment to register, and that would depend on the number of credits that you enroll in. Um, so waitlisted courses um, or interim courses actually do not appear on your invoice um, yet until you're actually enrolled in courses. So the minimum payment would be basically uh, based on what courses and credits that you're enrolled in. Do first year admitted under psychology have priority for biology and chemistry courses considering they are some prereqs for some psychology courses? Um, I don't know offhand, but again, if you go and look on the timetable builder, um, and look up uh, the biology first year course, for example, and then check enrollment controls, it will tell you which students have priority. So it may prioritize psychology students, I'm just not totally sure, but that's how you can check for that course or any other course. If I take neuroscience as a major, can I change it to a specialist? What would my other major be? Um, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, so we don't we don't offer a neuroscience major at UTM. Uh, the neuroscience is only offered as a specialist program. Um, it does fall under the um, psychology department, um, but we don't offer it as a major. So it is a specialist program. And if you're interested in uh, pursuing a neuroscience specialist, um, you can just do the specialist. You don't need to consider another major. Um, that will be sufficient for you to complete your degree, uh, unless you want to pick up another minor. Um, that you're interested in, such as, um, you know, language studies major, you know, linguistics ma minor, for example, or um, um, ethics law and society, philosophy minor. So it is up to you, but you don't have to. If you're doing a specialist, you don't need to do another major or minor. Um, but if you decide to do the psychology major, then you would have to choose another major. And that could be biology, it could be bit management, it could be anything that would be best, that would best work with your interests. So we only have about five minutes left, so we're going to try to get through a few more questions. Um, so do your best to, to post it in, um, and we'll do our best to answer them. If I want to do postgraduate studies, for example, medical school, would summer courses be an issue? Depends, yeah. I can take it. Um, yeah, sure. It's best to look at the med schools that you're applying to. They have some pretty um, stiff requirements. Um, they often want to see you taking a full course load. Um, they 
they sometimes will stipulate what they think about summer school courses. So do take a look at the schools you're most interested in applying to um, to make sure that you're meeting all of the requirements um, as early as your first year. So yeah. Not all programs are as demanding as medical school, so if you're interested in other ones, just take a look and see what they want for their admissions. And our career center also helps students with, um, you know, not only with career planning, but also with um, future education plans. Um, so if you're interested in medical school or other grad schools, um, they can help you navigate through, you know, their requirements, the, the different options that you have. So do reach out to the career center. Okay. The medical communications minor, HSC 200, is a requirement, but Bio 152, 153 are its prerequisites. I'm doing them in my first and second semester, so when can I take this course, this 200 level course? Um, if it is a prerequisite, then you'd have to wait until you complete those courses to take the course. Um, so you wanna maybe double check and see if it is um, uh, required, you know, does it list them as prerequisites or maybe co-requisites? So that's a, maybe a difference. Um, I, but it may be best to check the timetable builder in course planner, but if it does list them as prerequisites, then you can take this um, course in your second year. And it means that the department is aware that students, you know, would be applying to this program in their second year, and that's what they are looking for in that case. But double check and see uh, yeah. uh, the academic calendar and timetable builder. And that may not be required for entering the program, but maybe that course is required to complete that program, in which case you can take it in your second or third year. What scholarships, what are the scholarships available at UTM or the government? I missed the deadline for scholarship, but I really need one. Any advice about scholarships? Yeah, so uh, we do actually have, uh, if you go on our uh, Office of the Register website, we do have um, a scholarship section where you can actually um, explore scholarships that are offered at UTM and at U of T, and you can actually filter uh, on the basis of, you know, are you an international or domestic student? Does the scholarship require, a, you know, an application? Or are you automatically considered based on your grades or... Um, and what is it on the basis? Uh, is it um, on the basis of uh, need? Also, is it uh, or merits like academic performance or participation? You know, your leadership. Um, you know, extracurricular activities, things like that. So, go on the um, uh, on our website and explore the uh, scholarships um, that we are what that we have at UTM and at U of T. So we have uh, Award Explorer is actually what it is mm -hmm. called. And so you can go there and explore. Uh, we also have a section for um, grants and bursaries. Um, a lot of the grants and bursaries are open for domestic students who are also uh, in receipt of government funding. So you might want to check the eligibility criteria. And they may also require you to be considered um, to be enrolled in full-time studies. So uh, some are automatically, again, considered. Some are need uh, application. So do check it out. Um, if you have more questions, you can um, uh, you can uh, contact our financial aid advising team through Ask Registrar. Okay, I think we have time for one last question, and then we're going to have to wrap it up for today. For someone who's interested in dental school, do you know if there's a way to connect with someone from the Faculty of Dentistry at U of T? Um, I can take this one. I think the easiest thing to do is look up, obviously, the dental school at U of T, um, and then check to see if they have any information sessions, um, and check to see who their recruitment and admissions people are and try to connect with them directly that way. And our career center, I think, holds um, grad fairs where you can actually talk to different grad schools about their programs. And these usually happen at UTM as well. So you might want to check their events throughout the year to see uh, when that would be scheduled so that you can reach out and, you know, chat with uh, different schools about their requirements and, and uh, um, other information about their programs. All right, well, thank you for attending. Thank you all for attending. Um, just a reminder, we'll be sending a, um, a survey link. Uh, so we'd love to hear your feedback about, um, you know, how you uh, found the session and uh, what you found most helpful. Um, so the survey will be sent to the email that you use to sign up for this um, webinar. So it'll be sent to you within um, the next hour. So keep checking your email and we'd love to hear your feedback. And so thank you all for joining. I'd also like to thank um, Dre and our two leaders, um, for, our peer leaders for 
um, uh, helping me today. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in our next events. Thank you.